From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Well, I'm actually quite uh, impressed by the actions that the Pakistani government is now taking. I think that uh, action was called for and action uh, has been forthcoming. As the Pakistani and Afghan presidents visit Washington, Pakistani helicopter gunships and warplanes bomb sites in the Savat Valley. Tens of thousands of civilians continue to flee the area. We'll get the latest. Then a Senate hearing examines the future of journalism. The original sin of American newspapering lies in going to Wall Street in the first place. When locally based, family owned newspapers like The Sun were consolidated into publicly owned newspaper chains, an essential dynamic and essential trust between journalism and the communities served by that journalism was betrayed. We'll play the testimony of former Baltimore Sun reporter David Simon, best known as the creator of the award winning TV series The Wire and Homicide. Then China says just over 5,300 school children died or remain missing after last year's devastating Sichuan earthquake. The official number is far lower than news reports at the time. A new HBO documentary premiering tonight visits with parents in the days after the disaster. It's called China's Unnatural Disaster, The Tears of Sichuan Province. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Estimates of the dead from Monday's U.S. bombing of the Afghan province of Farah are now reaching as high as 200. Images released from the area show villagers sorting through the rubble of the devastating attack. An unidentified village elder said he'd lost dozens of relatives. We've discovered 52 dead bodies. There might be more we haven't found as yet. These martyred people were civilian residents of this area. All these 52 martyred are either my nephews, nieces, or my grandchildren. The Red Cross has confirmed dozens of civilians were killed, including many women and children. The attack could prove to be the deadliest U.S. bombing of Afghan civilians since the U.S. invasion of 2001. Meeting with Afghan President Hamid Karzai in Washington, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton expressed U.S. regret. I wish to express uh, you know, my personal regret and certainly the sympathy of our administration on the loss of civilian life. Uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, we deeply regret it. We don't know all of the circumstances or uh, causes, and there will be a joint investigation um, by your government and ours. But any loss of life, any loss of innocent life, is particularly painful. The U.S. military suggesting it ev has evidence showing the victims were actually killed by Taliban grenades, but hasn't offered any proof. Karzai was in Washington along with Pakistani President Asif Ali as, uh, Zardari. The two leaders later met President Obama, who said they all face the same enemy in the Taliban. The security of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the United States are linked. In the weeks that have followed, that truth has only been reinforced. Al-Qaeda and its allies have taken more lives in Pakistan and Afghanistan and have continued to challenge the democratically elected governments of the two presidents standing here today. Meanwhile, Al-Qaeda plots against the American people and people around the world from their safe haven along the border. Zardari and Karzai's visit to Washington comes as lawmakers take up an Obama administration request for $2.3 billion in aid to Pakistan and more than $800 million in military assistance for Afghanistan. In a split with Democratic leaders, House Appropriations Chair David Obey is proposing the U.S. condition the funding on the Afghan and Pakistani government's ability to meet several benchmarks. In Iraq, at least 12 people were killed Wednesday in two separate bombings in Baghdad. Most of the victims died in an attack on a crowded vegetable market killing 11 people and wounding at least 37. A local grocer witnessed the bombing. The truck entered the market and people were slaughtered. What did porters, grocers and farmers do to deserve to be killed? Increased around Baghdad with last month being the deadliest in more than a year. The U.S. military has dropped its attempt to retry uh, Aaron Watada, the first Army officer to refuse deployment to Iraq. On Wednesday, a federal appeals court granted a military request to withdraw an appeal of a lower court ruling that said a second court-martial would have violated Watada's right against double jeopardy. Watada's first court-martial ended in a mistrial. Watada's attorney says he intends to leave the military and attend law school. The pro-Israeli government lobby 
AIPAC has launched a new campaign to prevent the Obama administration from pressuring Israel to engage in peace talks. AIPAC is urging lawmakers to sign on to a congressional measure that urges Obama not to dictate how Israel negotiates with Palestinian leaders. The administration says it supports a two-state solution, though it hasn't called for a full Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories where a Palestinian state would be created. Israel opposes the two-state solution and wants to retain Jewish only settlements in the occupied West Bank. Meanwhile, the Israeli government's rejected the findings of a U.N. report that found it deliberately and recklessly attacked U.N. facilities and personnel during its three-week attack on the Gaza Strip. Speaking at U.N. headquarters Wednesday, the Israeli president, Shimon Peres, said Israel rejects the report's every word. We have the regard for the Secretary General. We don't accept one word over the board right. They didn't have to write it. They were unfair. They were one-sided. Meanwhile, in Israel and the occupied territories, an Israeli medical human rights group says a growing number of Palestinian patients have been interrogated by Israeli agents before leaving the Gaza Strip for medical care. The Israeli chapter of Physicians for Human Rights says at least 438 patients were interrogated while trying to leave Gaza between January 2008 and March of this year. Back in the United States, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse has announced plans to convene the first congressional hearing on the torture of foreign prisoners since last month's release of Bush administration memos authorizing the torture. As chair of the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Administrative Oversight in the Courts, Whitehouse says he plans to call on witnesses, including former FBI agent Ali Soufan and former State Department lawyer Philip Zelikow. U.S. health officials have confirmed they were delayed in responding to the swine flu outbreak because of Bush administration rules imposed after the 9-11 attacks. The Financial Times reports Mexican officials sent samples from infected patients in mid-April, but U.S. restrictions on imported biological materials meant the samples first had to be sent for analysis in Canada. American scientists had already analyzed several swine flu cases without realizing it was the same virus. There have now been two confirmed swine flu deaths in the U.S., both in Texas. A Justice Department probe has found the FBI's terrorist watch list has endangered national security by retaining some 24,000 names without justification while excluding many who have been investigated. In addition to risking national security, the probe found the watch list has also caused lengthy delays at airports, along highways and other travel areas in the United States. Maine's become the fifth state to legalize gay marriage. On Wednesday, Democratic Governor John Baldacci signed a measure backing same-sex marriage following its approval in the Maine legislature. New Hampshire is expected to follow suit as early as today. New Hampshire lawmakers have sent Democratic Governor John Lynch a similar measure to sign into law. The Senate's approved a foreclosure assistance bill providing limited help for struggling homeowners. The measure would protect mortgage service companies from lawsuits in return for taking part in federal loan modification programs. It would also give renters of foreclosed properties at least 90 days eviction notice and spend some $2.6 billion on curbing homelessness. Last week, the Senate dropped a key amendment that would have allowed bankruptcy judges to reduce mortgage payments for debt-strapped homeowners. Meanwhile, a new study shows the top 25 companies responsible for subprime mortgages spent nearly $370 million in lobbying over the past decade. According to the Center for Public Integrity, the companies originated an estimated $1 trillion in subprime loans between 2005 and 2007. Most of them are now out of business. In California, wildfires have erupted around Santa Barbara County. More than 8,000 residents have been evacuated as firefighters try to contain the blaze. The retail giant Walmart has reached a settlement to avoid charges for the death of a worker crushed by a stampede of shoppers last December. 34-year-old Jimmy Tai Damour was killed after a crowd of 2,000 broke down store doors and ran him over shortly before the store's opening in Long Island, New York. Walmart will pay nearly $2 million and pledge to improve safety at its New York stores. A new poll has found a majority of Americans support marijuana legalization. According to Zogby, 52 percent of Americans say it makes sense to tax and regulate marijuana. And in financial news, 
Each of the 12 regional Federal Reserve banks have been found to have directors who are either board members of banks or who own shares in bank holding companies. Consumer advocates say directors of Fed banks shouldn't have any financial ties to the institutions they're supposed to regulate. Scrutiny is focusing on Stephen Friedman, the chair of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Earlier this week, the Wall Street Journal revealed Friedman was given a waiver to hold shares in his former company, Goldman Sachs, even after it became a regulated bank holding firm. Friedman was also found to have bought the shares in Goldman Sachs before he was granted the legal waiver. The shares are now estimated to be worth more than $2 million. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.